everybody. It's day 10 of Christmas Family Devotions. Today we're in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. I don't know if you've ever seen a shooting star, uh, but I love watching for shooting stars. Ever since I was a kid, we used to sleep outside in the backyard on blankets at night and uh, just watch the stars. And if you've ever seen one, um, something even more rare is to actually hear one. And uh, for a long time, when people reported hearing the crackling sound of a shooting star, a scientist dismissed it as fiction for years because meteors burn up about 60 miles above the surface of the Earth, which means um, if there was any noise, it would take, you know, about five minutes for it to reach the surface of the Earth. But astronomers now say it's possible. There's what's called electrophonic meteors that give off some very low frequency radio waves. And when those waves traveling at the speed of light uh, interact with things close to the ground, it actually, in your ear, sounds like a sizzling noise. And so there you go. The scientists came around and finally said, this thing that seems impossible is actually scientifically true. In the passage we look at today, we see the wise men following a star that led them to the coming Messiah. And many wonder what this star was, but there seems to be no definitive explanation scientifically or even in the uh, theological realm but it seems to be a fulfillment of Balaam's prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, where it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And so some people believe this is a natural phenomenon, maybe a supernova, comet, um, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that took place in 6 B.C., but if it was a natural event, it's something God set into motion. And so by his power, uh, marked off the day and the time which these wise men would set out on a journey to find Christ. But also, it could be a supernatural thing. Some people think it could be the Shekinah glory, God's glory, like leading his people with the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night through the wilderness. Others believe it was a guiding angel. But whatever it was, the star pointed out the Messiah to the wise men. Though we don't have an explanation, one day we will. In the beginning of this passage, you see Herod the king, also known as Herod the Great, who lived from 73 BC to 4 BC. He was of small physical stature, a little over four feet tall, but known for his great accomplishments like famine relief. He was a genius at building. Uh, many of the buildings in Israel he oversaw the construction of, including the temple re renovation. Um, but more than being famous, Herod was infamous because of his heavy taxes. He was cruel, paranoid. He was a megalomaniac, obsessed with his own power. He killed his close associates. He killed his wife, Miriam, but later built a monument to her because he missed her. He killed three of his own sons, two of his brother-in-laws, and even his mother-in-law. And Augustus said of him, It's safer to be Herod's pig than his son. The Roman Empire called Herod king, which the Jews resented because he was not of the Davidic line. He wasn't a full-blooded Jew, which actually he was an Idumean, uh, an offspring of Esau. Jesus is of the Davidic line, and he now appears the true legitimate king of Israel, and that's a threat to Herod's kingdom. The wise men from the east belonged to the Persian or Median priestly caste. They were scientists, experts in mysteries, astronomy, sacred writings, dream interpretation, and so they heavily pursued wisdom and magic and nature and science. And so they're known, though, for combining both secular and religious aspects of their knowledge and understanding. They played both political and religious roles and were figures of prominence in their society. In Old Testament times, we see Daniel was put in charge of them when he was in Babylon, in Daniel 2.48. In the New Testament times, they were renowned for their great education as scientists and scholars, astronomers, and magicians. They studied books with mystery, mysterious references to the future. In the New Testament times, they were also renowned for their great education, they were known as having studied books with mysterious references to the future. They were influenced, no doubt, by Daniel's prophecies and the Old Testament prophecies. 
for many of us, when we hear about the wise men, we think of that song, We Three Kings. But the idea of there being three of them came from the gifts that were offered to Christ of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so people think that there were one for each one of those gifts, uh, but they weren't kings and there weren't just three of them. We don't know how many there were, uh, but they were wealthy, which is evidenced by their costly gifts and the great trip that they undertook to find Christ. They were men of stature and position. They were able to enter the presence of King Herod. They were accompanied by a large entourage, no doubt, of attendants and guards. The journey that they took was over a distance of 800 miles. If they traveled 20 miles a day, which is being generous, it would have taken them 40 days to get from their home to Christ's home. Herod believed that Christ at this point was two years old or younger. And that's based on the time the wise men tell him that the star first appeared. And then they got their journey planned out and got their um, entourage together and made their long journey over 800 miles. Uh, you'll see in this passage that Jesus is referred to not as an infant, but as a toddler, a child in the Greek language. Also, when they find him, he's not in a manger, he's in a house. When Herod had heard of the Messiah being born, he wanted to find out where he was going to be born. And so he called the religious leaders who quoted Micah 5.2, which we looked at a few days ago. It speaks of the Messiah coming, and the religious leaders understood this to be a reference to the coming king. There's four responses to Christ's birth in this passage. First of all, this Herod, and he was troubled. That word troubled is way too weak of a translation for his reaction. In actuality, that word means that he was in turmoil or he was even terrified. The Messiah was a direct threat to his throne, and he was afraid of losing his power. And so being hostile toward God and his Messiah, um, he secretly meets with the wise men to discover the age and location that he might try to wipe him out which we'll see a little later in this chapter of Matthew. But secondly, there's all Jerusalem. And their response is to be troubled with Herod. Because of Herod's ruthless nature, maybe they were a little bit freaked out on what he was going to do about all this. If Herod wasn't happy, nobody was happy. And so they were more afraid of Herod than they were of God, where they should have had a fear of the Lord, in response to the Messiah being born and rejoicing that he was born and maybe even going out and trying to find him to worship him. But they didn't. Now the religious leaders responded a little bit differently. They knew all the right answers about where the Messiah was to be born. Christ was only five miles away from them. They were so close to the Son of God, but they did not go in search for him. And so what we see among them is an apathetic response. They didn't care. Maybe they were too prideful or caught up in their own lives and positions. They were comfortable with religion. They, they liked their Bible studies. But in studying the scriptures, they had a history of missing Christ in the scripture. Then lastly, we have the response of the wise men, which was one of worship. In verses 9 through 12, we see this response of worship. The star stops. They rejoice exceedingly. They're so excited that their journey has come to an end. And they have finally made it to the place where they will meet the one, the Messiah, because of all the cost of their trip, all the time that they invested, the passion that they had. When that star stops, there's excitement and rejoicing. Now, they enter the house. Notice it's not a manger. And when they do, they fall down before this child, who is anywhere between one and two years old, and they worship him. And so you see this stark contrast of these powerful men on their face before um, a child, but they know who he is mostly. They know that he is the Messiah. And so they offer him gifts. One of the gifts is gold, which is gift for a king. It's very costly. The other is incense or frankincense. It's a glittering odorous gum obtained from making incisions on the bark of several types of trees. And that's a gift for deity or for a priest to offer up in worship. And then lastly, there's myrrh from a tree found in Arabia that makes 
a very valued spice and perfume. It's used for embalming. And so we see per perhaps even a prophetic nature to these gifts. They give gold to Christ the King, incense, because he is God in the flesh, a gift for deity, and myrrh, looking forward to Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And so in verse 12, we see God speaks to them in a dream, and, and, and God tells them, don't go back to her. Go back by a different way secretly. And we see the last sign of their worship in that they obey Worshiping Jesus is more than just singing songs and offering gifts. It requires our whole life. And so these men worship through their obedience. Christ said in Luke 9, 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Be wise like these wise men and seek him tonight. Worship him tonight together as a family. Enjoy your family devotion tonight and we'll talk to you tomorrow.